imagine if you as a tiktok user is uploading a 10 second video which is only in english but that can be uploaded in five different languages on the go so that's the future that we imagine And welcome back to Slater Pod. Joining us today is Anuja Devan, co-founder of Dubverse, the online dubbing platform that recently raised uh, $800,000 in a C round. Uh, hello Anuja. Hey there. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be talking here. And uh, thank you for mentioning about the raise. I think uh, one of the best uh, written article I would say we came out from Slater for us and it was very very interesting to read uh, along with not just like one news but like or uh, in depth uh, into the market what's happening so really excited to be talking with you on on what's happening with the localization with great thanks so much and you're glad you read you read the piece and you and you liked it so today where does this podcast find you what country what city i am in india and specifically in the uh, delhi and cr region so based out of the capital of the country and uh, here is our small team trying to do a few big stuffs for the world Sounds great. So, tell us a bit more about your background. How how did you get started with this idea? The idea of uh, you know, dubbing AI dubbing. Sure, definitely. So, uh, how we call India uh, within ourselves, we are a land of languages. Every state, every city, for that matter, has a different uh, language or a dialect that we speak within uh, different regions uh, uh, specifically. So basically, the idea uh, got started or got germinated with uh, when my co-founder Varshul and my long-time friend as well uh, was sort of working on AI. He's been into AI for about seven years. He's done a bunch of projects there. I uh, went to IIT Delhi also to do a research paper in computer vision. So he uh, sort of came up with this idea when lockdown happened specifically. COVID was hitting across, and uh, we could see everybody going back and locked up in their houses. Only internet was the way way to interact with the world. So that's when uh, that's when he thought about it. That okay, there is an enough education material available for the tier one. or for people who understand english but what about the people who do not who do not have access or who do not understand this language uh, equally how do they upskill themselves so that's where it got germinated from uh, then we spent quite a bit of time understanding of how this problem can be solved using technology what sort of a, a part can ai generative ai play in this that's how it got started uh, from then to now it's been about 2 years i believe and uh, we we tested the waters uh, did a few things here in that for education bit i'm sure we'll talk about in detail uh, but uh, that's when we realized that it's not only education it's it's way beyond that uh, because the amount of content which is being generated right now uh, is immense and it's everywhere and specifically video content so that's where it got started from and uh, we are at a we've raised our first fund we've certain validation from the market so those those are the building blocks for the journey that we've taken over Interesting that it came from uh, the education idea, but then of course very quickly uh, expanded into other areas. So uh, you did mention co-founders, but tell me a bit more about kind of around the co-founders, maybe current leadership team. Uh, you know how many people otherwise are on the team. What what kind of are their functions? What are their roles? What are their backgrounds? Sure. So we are a small team, and that's how we plan to be because we are a deep tech company. We're trying to do things at scale using technology. So we are a lean team of seven people as of now. and primarily heavier on the engineering side so virtual uh, like i mentioned is the ai engine or the ai by brain behind the whole project that we are uh, we got started and now it has taken a shape of a company uh, so he looks at the product and the technology side of things where we come up with new magical way of doing things using technology in the language space specifically uh, then we have a ai engineer uh, sp- uh, working on our voices on our translations how to make that more contextual uh, so a lot of work is being done on the ai side and very soon you should be seeing a lot of a uh, uh, lot of details a lot of technology coming out of dubverse uh, because there's a lot of uh, cutting edge things that we are doing and experimenting with uh, then uh, again more on the product and engineering side is what we have more people uh, then we also what we've done is that we understood that we obviously do not come from a, a translator or a linguistic background so we've onboarded someone recently from that uh, space who understands who's been a translator himself for for the last 4 years and has worked with the likes of google netflix on different sort of pro- projects localization projects for them so we believe somebody from the industry was really required for us to get that nuance on how are you supposed to move when you move between uh, different languages so that's what we are trying to do we are trying to relate ourselves more to the language world 
uh, we also have a uh, we have multiple consultants working with us who uh, have pioneered in in the terms of AI or NLP in terms of language and voice recognition specifically. So core team is of seven people, but obviously we work with a bunch of people to make sure that we are headed in the right direction. Got it. So I use Dubverse. Uh, I use the free trial, the one minute that's on your website, which is fantastic. And I used it for one of our podcasts, actually, from English into German. I really enjoyed the experience. Now, tell us a bit more about uh, what kind of languages you currently cover, because you did cover the one I speak German, right? But uh, what languages do you currently cover? And then, like, what's the expansion plan, kind of Indian languages versus, you know, European languages, et cetera, versus uh, other Asian languages? Sure, definitely. Thanks for trying it out. And I would request uh, the listeners as well, go try out the demo. It's, it's, it would just take you under a minute to get that uh, dubbed version in your language. Uh, currently, we cover uh, about 30 plus languages. Uh, so this is a mixed pack of Indian uh, vernacular languages, uh, the majorly spoken ones, and a few international languages, again, the majorly spoken ones. Uh, the idea from day one was not only to stick around to India. Obviously, uh, what we've seen, is seen around the problem that we saw why all of this started was an Indian problem uh, because we could see that not everybody understands English. So if I have to tell you there's only 10% of India which speaks, in, speaks English or understands English in a fluent way, 90% does not. And if you look at the content available on the internet, 75% of the content is in English still. So that's the gap that we saw and we jumped into and we saw a great opportunity there. Uh, but again, like like uh, the Indian problem, I, uh, we believe that in the Europe, that, that's a very similar problem from a language standpoint, that there are smaller regions which speak a specific language and newer people coming onto the internet or uh, these people want to consume more content in their own native language and not just move on to English. Uh, overall. So we do not see this as just an Indian problem, but a global problem. Uh, very interestingly, there's a lot of uh, inflow from the US as well, for that matter, from a, uh, from a standpoint that e English to Spanish, right? So we see that also coming as a very, very strong use case as in India, we see English to Hindi use case sort of coming in. Uh, so from a problem statement standpoint, we are definitely a global product from day one. And uh, hence, uh, that's the reason I want to have a conversation with you as well to understand how does the market look like on that side of the world, uh, understand better, build a product which can be globally acceptable, uh, globally used uh, uh, very seamlessly. So that's the idea when we see here. Uh, we are supporting, like I said, 30 languages and very soon we plan to add more languages. Uh, we we will have way, uh, way uh, coverage from 100 plus languages very soon. You mentioned before that uh, Dubverse, you consider it a deep tech company, and there's this huge kind of universe of um, components around like processing voice, machine translation, uh, you know, speech to text, et cetera. How do you evaluate what are you really building with your own kind of engineering and, you know, a machine learning team and what components of the stack that are using you're, you know, buying or licensing or subscribing to? Sure. So definitely we are a deep tech company because uh, what we believe is we are trying to solve a problem which has not been solved as yet in the world. Uh, a platform like this or a, or a service or a technology like this does not exist, which is able to give you contextual translation into a different language altogether. Hence, we are doing something new. Uh, hence, we call ourselves deep tech. But we are very, very user focused. It's not that we, we know what has to be built. We are completely 100% reliant on the market uh, to tell us what is required. Uh, so basically what we call internally super users, uh, we have 20 of these super users who like we chit chat with on a daily basis to understand. And these are all bulk video creators uh, when for whatever purposes they are creating a lot of videos, either in an individual capacity or for their company that they're working at. Uh, but the idea is to understand what does the workflow look like and become a part of that workflow. Uh, the idea is not to bring everybody to onto our platform, but for us to go to them and become a part of their workflow uh, primarily. Uh, so uh, this, these technologies, if we talk about your speech-to-text, text-to-speech, or uh, text-to-text translation, all the combination of three that we use specifically at Dubverse, these have been uh, this has been in existence for quite some time, but in silos, right? You you have multiple softwares where you can just go go and do text-to-speech, you can do speech-to-text, you can do translation. So what Dubverse is trying to do is trying to bring all of these together in a productified manner where any any person with a no-code uh, capacity can just come onto the platform and use it. 
uh, the idea here is not to reinvent the wheel. Uh, the translation has existed uh, for a very long time and there are multiple bigger players who are doing it across languages. Uh, so that definitely acts like a base for us to get started at least. But the idea is, uh, or the problem that we, that we see right now is that those things are not contextual. So how we look at this problem is that we've broken it down uh, at a segment level, at a, uh, at a category level, so to say, that we only pick one category. For an example, sports is one of the biggest category that we're sort of working with right now, uh, that we do uh, enough work within the sports category that if we reach out to a sports person or a sports category video, we are able to translate that without any human involvement. Right now, when we do a translation, there is a quality analysis which is required to make sure that whatever the machine has generated is of a certain quality, it can be understood, it is a more contextual, it is more conversational rather than a literal translation. So that's the idea that we are headed after, that we pick a category, we solve for it, and then we sort of replicate it across. Interesting. You mentioned sports. So, you know, sports is full of emotion. And, and so how, how do you think about, like, What's the primary technical hurdle when you're looking at like producing kind of emotional AI voices or robo voices or whatever the, the, the appropriate term is, synthetic voice? Sure. So two things here. When, we are, when I say sports, we are primarily looking at sports training. Uh, so there are different types of courses which are out there. There are different type of uh, uh, training videos which are out there from a sports standpoint, which can be of physical sports like a swimming or a, or a football or a cricket or anything on those lines or soft skills like a chess or, or things on those lines. So these are more training videos where somebody is trying to learn a specific sport, how to play, how to learn the techniques, so on and so forth. So those are the sort of videos that we are doing. Uh, but definitely emotions is, uh, is the biggest uh, a hurdle and the most challenging aspect right now with when it comes to AI translation because I'm sure you've you've heard those uh, Alexa is that you know it's a machine which is speaking so we have certain solutions there uh, so we internally at Dubbers have been able to uh, uh, prepare an engine wherein with minimal input we are able to create an AI speaker of an actual human voice so for an example for myself as well there exists a cyber anuja uh, which is basically able to imitate my voice is able to imitate the way I speak and is an AI speaker. So anybody, any any creator can basically use my voice uh, on top of their uh, content uh, video and uh, dub it in English. Uh, but obviously I'm not a professional. So what we've gotten onto is that we are going to professional voiceover artists now and recording that only one hour of data is what we need as input. And as an output, we are able to create their AI speaker which will uh, 90, 90, 95% match whatever they are speaking, however they speak, however they convey a message, that's been replicated into our AI system. So our uh, target is sort of to take this to 100%, and then uh, the boundaries are endless, that you just once record a person's voice, and he or she can uh, create any sort of content for you uh, from there on. I'm still a little hesitant to like give my voice <laughs> to somebody. I guess my English voice you could just get from YouTube now, like after like 126 podcasts. But uh, it's yeah, it's it's a challenge, I guess, getting people to sign over their voice. But anyway, on a different topic. Um, so how important are like social media video networks for you, like YouTube, TikTok, kind of as a channel? And are you seeing some shifts like in the past two years since you started? Like just in terms of the adoption of these network, these uh, networks and uh, yeah. Definitely, I think YouTube and TikTok have played the biggest role in terms of how content is consumed, right? And uh, initially it was more that, okay, it was more about music, it was only about those things. But then when these content creators in the last uh, two to three years, when they've come on board, so if you can't, like if you're stuck anywhere in your life, right? You would just go to YouTube and you would just like, uh, search for a video and you'll have a solution for it. So interesting story, I was one time traveling and I had this uh, scooty, uh, scooter with myself and I was unable to unlock the boot uh, because it was just a little complicated. And what I did was I actually Googled a review and in that review, this person explained how to open it and I was able to do it. So I'm just saying that it's not only entertainment, it has just become a very critical part of our lives right now, wherein, whereas anything we want to do, we go to YouTube and we have an answer from there. Uh, likewise for TikTok as well, right? So TikTok made it so simple for anybody to be a creator. It was just like a click away. And <laughs> like we've seen what TikTok has been able to do. Uh, similar ways, what we also see in India happening is that there are multiple other apps which have come out after TikTok was uh, banned in India. 
uh, which is share chat, mod, so on and so forth. Again, very similar on the lines of TikTok, where they are able to give bite-sized content, which is very, very quick and easy to adapt. So I think adoption because of these applications of the internet has gone immensely high. And uh, that's the reason people have come out to the internet and now they're using it for different purposes as well. So that adoption, which could have taken more years, all of these apps have accelerated and multifold. And very uh, a good shift that very good shift that we uh, also see along with this is uh, the, the requirement or the demand, which is increased from a vernacular standpoint or from a standpoint that I want to consume content in my language, I just don't want to see English. And that's the reason we see the supply also increasing from a certain standpoint where these uh, individual YouTubers, individual people are creating multilingual content and not just sticking to English as a language on the internet. Yeah, 100%. I was going to ask you about India and, uh, you know, after TikTok ban, TikTok's ban, like what are some of the apps that have emerged that are taking kind of TikTok's role? And like, are you, is it easy for you to cover them or does it take additional work or how does that work? ShareChat, uh, I believe, is the biggest right now. I'm not sure of the exact stats, but uh, ShareChat uh, is one of, again, similar sort of an application where you can go and just create bite-sized, very, very easy content. Uh, so multiple such apps have uh, come forward. And the adoption for that is insane because, again, the population in India is on a higher side. So if you launch an application which is more consumer friendly, if they're getting those returns, if they're getting that engagement, more and more people will be more than willing to join those. So we see that happening. For us as dubbers, uh, I think that's a little more step two for us. Uh, on step one, we are trying to solve for this contextual translation within different fields and make our system more robust, make our AI more contextual. And once that's done, we would love to uh, sort of integrate with these applications. So imagine if you, as a TikTok user, is uploading a, a video, like a 10-second video maybe, which is only in English, but that can be uploaded in five different languages on the go. So that's the sort of future that we imagine to with all of these different applications that you are doing it once, but that gets published in multiple so that your addressable market is uh, tenfold, twentyfold, depending on the number of languages you publish it in. So when you're looking to expand into kind of the B2B space, business to business in Europe and the United States, like who would be an early kind of best fit client for you at the moment? Sure. So we are, uh, uh, to start with, we're going after the smaller setup. So more like our SMB, small and medium businesses is what we primarily look at. Uh, because we because we believe that those are easier to work with, uh, that it's faster turnaround time, that we like sort of pitch a, pitch, a, uh, pitch a product, pitch a use case that we sort of look at, and that can be like within the coming week, we can sort of start working on it and start delivering. So we would say uh, two specific use cases that we see. One is specifically which are creating a lot of videos as their main product. Uh, so for the like the, the likes that I mentioned, uh, that if you're creating any sort of course from a martial art training to how to use Excel to anything on those lines. So if you're creating a lot of uh, content there, video commerce is one of the very interesting things which has come out again from a video standpoint. Uh, those can be directly used. Or if you're creating videos to support your main product or service, so product explainer videos, how to videos, feature adoption videos, so on and so forth, all of those also can be very easily translated. Because what we see in India, and I'm sure it's the uh, similar scene in uh, Europe as well, that when you're creating a product, it's not only consumed by one uh, language speaking audience. Uh, so maybe the owner speaks a different language, the worker in the outlet is speaking a different language. So if you're only restricting yourself to one language, the adoption becomes a barrier. So that's the barrier that we are here to break. 100%. So talk to us a little bit about the role of kind of human uh, linguists on the linguistic side in your automated workflow. Like what are you working with human linguists for, uh, with, and like what, what are kind of components are you uh, kind of having them review or update or tweak? Sure. So uh, basically, yeah, right now, like I said, that there is a linguistic or there is a, a language, there is a human in the lupus which is required. Because if I explain you how Dubbers works, is basically it's a video on video out. So we primarily only and only focus on the video content as of now. Uh, so the platform that we build is as simple as that you bring a video, which can be on any of these platforms, YouTube, Vimeo, or you can locally upload. Uh, we ingest that video. We do a text. Or we do a speech to text. Then we do a text to text translation in whatever language that you want to move into. And then we do a text to speech uh, basis that specific language. Uh, this is this is happening almost in real time. So for a five minute uh, video, you will take about 30 seconds to get that output in the second language. So it's a real time uh, that we're able to produce an output. But this is machine generated. So here there are certain contextual things uh, which uh, are required for a person to go back and relook into it. 
uh, so it has to be a linguist who understands this brand understands the audience which is going to consume this content so uh, those are the nuances which still needs to be sort of looked at so a 5 minute uh, video takes about a 15 minute review and uh, then it is good to go from a published standpoint we usually uh, try and uh, get a linguistic like a professional linguistic in place so that the nuances again can be taken care of uh, we also provide that as a service uh, when uh, when we understand that people do not have all language capabilities so we provide this as an additional service on top of our product uh, when you can come and use the product along with the service so that the output actual output that you get is 100% uh, ready to publish video which can be distributed as required but this is probably more kind of early stage i mean i guess you don't want to become an agency or get too deep into that component right we definitely don't want to but what we see and what we see in usual saas as well that it comes along with the service right uh, because saas definitely is the place to be there are multiple saas organizations which are coming at uh, but for that actual adoption there is that service arm which we see usually is required uh, so like i was in freshworks earlier there was a huge service arm that we still had to have to make sure that our product is being used to its best capacity right so from that uh, understanding and because here see what's happening is that if you want to go out and maybe uh, launch your podcast in hindi now if a system is able to do it you would still do not understand hindi so you will need somebody when you have that confidence where you have that credibility that this is the right sort of thing which has come out so for dubbers uh, to attain that credibility that our user whatever they are getting is 100% correct nobody needs to check it will take some 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 time for us to get there so until then we see that we need to uh, be able to give you that credibility through a human that somebody who understands hindi has looked through the video made corrections and now it is good to go so it's more uh, from an adoption adoption standpoint that we they are able to use our product when they have a capability issue in in terms of languages so that's how we look at it that makes a lot of sense okay I understand now so it's like an adoption acceleration um and yeah okay I, i get it yeah i get nervous when you mentioned that we would uh, launch slater pod in hindi i probably get nervous even if we did it in <laughs> german but <laughs> but we have a very specific audience you know so if we translated anything i'd be probably flooded with quality questions right off the bat um on another note like hiring i, I keep asking a lot of these uh, startups that we have in the pod about this question like it's it's must be very hard to hire machine learning talent in this kind of super competitive market uh do, how do you think about that how do you look for people hire people how do you get them excited about dubverse and like the division sure definitely that's that's one of the biggest challenge i think be just machine learning or otherwise for a founder to sort of build that founding team because there's so much more uh, that you want from a founding team at such a early stage than just or uh, be a good talent right there's a risk taking appetite that is to they to connect to the problem as well so on and so forth so very interestingly what has happened is that uh, the problem that we are working on from a india context is very interesting so when we sort of put this out to anybody uh, from a employee to a user to an investor also for that matter it just gets that in the first conversation oh wow how is this possible so that has really given us that head start to be honest with different conversations that we have and with a- with ai and ml people what what we see usually is that they are very uh, interested to solve very different problems right if you just give them a scale problem they they're like okay this is just one one of the other problem that i have to scale an application that's that's not a very interesting problem sort of to look at but when that this problem is interesting is very difficult and comes with a lot of indian context as well so we see that uh, coming and very fortunately actually one of the uh, ai engineers that we already have in place uh, was working with virtual earlier as well uh, so he's been around uh, before me to be honest uh, the ai engineer so i also sort of was working with fresh prof earlier i jumped into this little later when it was taking shape uh, so he's been around before me so we already have one and that gives us a very strong foundation from a ai standpoint but definitely that like going out and hiring a new person starting a conversation is brilliant for us uh, because we are from the industry virtual and i have been uh, in the startup world for about 8 years so we have that network extended network where uh, we are connected to the right set of people the problem is very interesting but definitely still hiring is a very difficult problem that we are still getting our heads around it you mentioned that you've been in the startup world for 8 years like did that also help connect with Kalari Capital the VCs that funded your uh, seed round or how did you come across them how, how was the process there investment was a interesting process we spoke to a lot of people and i think uh, that uh, made us better in what we are doing to be honest uh, so how uh, so when i was uh, back story little back story when i was interviewing as well uh, switching jobs moving one to another 
I literally took the interview process like a therapy session because there's somebody very smart sitting across and asking you very relevant questions. So that's how it came out. And I think that's something happened in the investment uh, piece as well because there are very smart people sitting across the table and asking you very genuine questions. So you have to be prepared first and then you think hard about that, right? Earlier, we were like, I think you're very interesting. Uh, we're able to go talk to users. Uh, people are ready to pay for this. We are able to onboard clients. All of that cycle was running. But then the hard question sort of hit you when you go out for investment. So I think that that made us uh, pretty strong from that standpoint. Uh, the investment cycle was brilliant. Kalari has been great. Uh, Kalari, very interestingly, was an incoming uh, that they reached out to us. Uh, obviously, people know when, when you're out there. Uh, so it worked out and uh, it, it went out very, very smoothly. I think uh, we had interaction with Vani Kola and uh, they also sort of are very, very bullish on the creator economy and this directly fit into their thesis and uh, we were able to move very quickly after that. So very interesting, uh, a lot of lessons to learn, to be honest, it was a very different sort of a conversation that you have there. Uh, when you're out there, out vulnerable, saying that, okay, we have some things, but then we have to like sort of put, put ourselves open to in front of everybody. So very interesting lessons came out from that. Uh, it looks like they do their homework if they caught you at that pre-seed very early stage. <laughs> definitely, definitely. One more, just briefly, like this whole metaverse, VR, kind of like, you know, it's been around now for what, since, I guess, since Meta or Facebook rebranded into Meta, right? Everybody's talking about it. Like, is this on your mind at all? Like, or or not at all? It's not, not, not an issue at the moment. When we sort of get into that world of metaverse, right? So how we look at it is that, that is real decentralization, right? That there are literally no boundaries where you are from, where are, what you do, what is your background, nobody knows and nobody's really interested. They're there in that certain environment which is being created and they just want to be there. And we see that this language or this communication is still going to be the only barrier that people face, uh, right? So from that standpoint, being in the language space and doing it through technology, I think this all of this is going to come together very beautifully. Uh, very interestingly, Varshan and I were discussing this when we sort of got started and this meta meta thing was happening, uh, that how uh, easily if you're able to get to, a, by the time this actually starts in terms of adoption and people have started more living in the metaverse, that that's, that's, that's the reality looking like. I think by that time we will have a, a contextual data and AI ready to be deployed in real time. So if I come, I speak whatever language, but you will only hear what you understand. It will be on the go. So I think to actually make that adoption wider and not just again stick around to your sort of people, I think the language barrier needs to be broken in the metaverse as well. I like when you're saying that this is like language is basically the last, if probably the most difficult barrier to break, right? Because yeah, we can all meet in the metaverse, but if you don't speak the same language, it's going to get tough. So, but I keep arguing that it might be beyond language and of course, a lot of cultural aspects, et cetera, to this as well, but um, interesting. People are more open to, towards it, I think. Uh, and I think if you go back and under, look at the globalized world as well, right? So the amount of movement that we see, uh, the reason why this translation industry exists at the pace that it does. Uh, so for an example, to give you an understanding of what's happening, at least in India, uh, that whenever earlier uh, uh, a high budget movie uh, from up because Bollywood is pretty big here, but that's where we take inspiration from in the country. Uh, in Bollywood, if there was a high budget movie coming, it was only Hindi. But in the last two years, what we've seen happening is there is no high budget movie just comes in in Hindi. It at least launches in four different languages because people are uh, becoming more aware where, where they, what is it that they want and everybody sort of has their spending capacity, all of those things are happening. So people are coming out of their shell of just their own cultures, just their own communities and are willing to sort of learn more of what's happening in the uh, parallel culture as well. So we see that happening. I'm sure that's happening globally as well. And uh, that's what I say that after globalization, only language is the only barrier that we see in the world. And apart from that, world is like our ocean. 100%. So tell us a bit more about the, your kind of roadmap as far as you can disclose for kind of 2020 and maybe a little bit beyond. Right now, what we are trying to do is that we are trying to solve primarily for the videos, the pre-recorded videos, wherein if you already had a set of, have a set of videos, which is in one language, uh, if you have a distribution channel, either it's a YouTube or some other platform, or it's more internal, uh, we see a lot of videos being created internally as well. So we are trying to take that multilingual. 
uh, our mission that we say at Dubverse is that every video will go multilingual uh, because that's the that's the capacity that we sort of look at with this uh, problem uh, that we've identified and the solution that we are building with. As next, what we want, really want to do is, uh, like I said, the share chat mod uh, thing that any platform basically that you are going and publishing content. So this will be on the creator side, uh, I think as a next step as well. Uh, when if you're just going and publishing any sort of content, you have like just a button there which says Dubverse and you can basically click it and you get uh, all the options in different languages and you can publish it right there. Uh, whatever platform it might be. So uh, for the creators uh, to make it super simple for them to dub videos and just basically use it. We very interestingly see a lot of use cases, this is maybe ahead in the future, uh, coming from a consumer side as well, wherein uh, we see like a lot of uh, people reaching out to us that there's very interesting TED talk that I want to show it to my parents, but they don't understand the language it is in. So can I use your platform to basically translate and just for our consumption and not for like a global consumption. So that also very interestingly is happening. Uh, let's see when we get to that. But uh, definitely the idea of with us is just to break that language barrier. Uh, there are multiple billion ways that how we can do it. We've started with a certain scenario to test the waters, to make our uh, system robust, to be able to do it. And then I think once we have that uh, system running, uh, there's a lot more that we can do. Got it. So good luck with that. And uh, thanks so much for taking the time today, Anucha. And I encourage everybody to go to dubverse.ai and check out uh, the one minute freebie and uh, play around with it. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much. Really uh, interesting uh, to be a part of this uh, podcast. I think Slater is doing brilliant work. I've, I've been following the uh, newsletter for quite some time now. So I get my dose of information definitely from the newsletter that you send across. And it's been really interesting for us to sort of keep learning about what's happening globally in the translation world. So thank you so much for having me here. And definitely go out, try, reach out to me if, if you guys see there's a use case that you want to dub videos. Uh, we are in beta phase, looking for our initial adoption and more than happy to chat uh, if you are creating videos. Great. Thanks so much, Anucha. Take care.